Hello and welcome back. I'm Professor Adam Thompson and this video is going to be a discussion about the assessment of an abdominal or GI emergency patient. And it's important to remember that a good patient assessment is the foundation of good patient care. It's super important to be uh, an expert at assessing your patients. And GI system emergencies often result from a medical condition rather than a traumatic condition. So, it, you know, it's usually going to take a little bit more detective work uh, than, you know, your traumatic injuries that are kind of what you see is what you got. These medical uh, conditions are, are a little bit more difficult to decipher. History of present illness is one of the most important areas of assessment. So make sure you ask those, those sample history questions, signs and symptoms, allergies, medications, their past medical history, uh, you know, what, what did they eat last, and you know when was that and what were they doing when this began and then ask the patient about their dietary habits if there's been any change in their diet any discharge from the body whether it be uh, you know vomiting or diarrhea loose stools dark stools um, do they have pain what type of pain do they have where is the pain located all of these things are super important when it comes to uh, you know figuring out what's going on with your patient coming up with a nice clear differential diagnosis and deciphering which treatment is required for your patient. All right, so pre-hospitally, we talk about the scene size up, and this is where safety is really taken into consideration, our own personal safety being number one, right? And so we're going to make sure we take standard precautions to prevent contact with infectious agents. That's important to us, but it's also important for our patients that we wear personal protective equipment, uh, you know, as necessary. And then clean your patients. You know, uh, cleaning the patient helps provide some degree of dignity to a person that might be humiliated by the circumstances of his or her disease. Uh, and if you treat your patients as if they were one of your relatives, uh, you'll go a long way in this profession. Um, so even though it's not the most desirable thing to do, uh, you know, use a little uh, patient advocacy and, and clean your patients up. Next we move into our primary survey. And the primary survey is always going to be, you know, uh, focusing on what you're there for. Uh, and any immediate life threats. All right, so you, you want to form your general impression. Where is the patient found? You know, are they in the bathroom on the toilet? Are they in bed? Are they on the floor? Uh, what is the patient's body posture? You know, this could be uh, anything from supine to curled over holding their abdomen in like the fetal position or, you know, maybe curled over vomiting while sitting on a toilet. Uh, all of these things are very important when taking, uh, you know, your general impression into account. And then is there an odor? Remember, an upper GI bleed may produce foul-smelling stool. All right, could be very odoriferous. And then after about two to five minutes, your nose will tire of the sending signal, and the smell will not be as noticeable. So it's, it's important early on in forming your general impression that you take note of these uh, you know, very pungent smells that you, know, you may surround a patient cluing you into what's going on with them. Next, we're going to move into airway and breathing as far, part of our uh, primary assessment. And, of course, this is important because this is where we find some life threats. If a patient has vomited, they have a greater chance of aspiration. And, and you don't want them to develop aspiration pneumonia. You don't want them to develop an airway compromise. Um, so make sure that the, if there's any vomit still in their mouth, we get, we're cleaning it out, we're suctioning, we're maintaining a nice patent and open, clean airway. Inspect the airway for foreign bodies. Uh, again, remove or suction obstructions within that airway. Uh, check for unusual odors. Patients who have extremely advanced bowel obstructions can have breath that actually smells like stool. They'll, they'll vomit, um, you know, uh, you know, unpassed stools because of that really bad bowel obstruction. And also another uh, odor to keep in mind is that metallic, you know, it kind of smells metallic. That could be blood. Um, you, so at, the more you come around these patients and, and assess them and you, you experience these different smells, It'll clue you in on, on what's going on with your patient. If a patient is having trouble breathing, uh, it typically stems from a severe complication. You know, often GI patients shouldn't have airway and breathing compromise, but if they do, that's a good indication that this is something pretty severe. They could be, uh, you know, in a decompensated septic shock or something like that. So um, airway and breathing compromises should, uh, you know, make you have a high index of suspicious, suspicion for something serious. Remember, when we're assessing the airway and the breathing, you're always going to want to monitor the patient's capnography 
to ensure that they have an effective respiratory pattern. And then breathing management includes giving them high concentration of oxygen if needed, preventing aspiration, of course, because anybody that has a risk for vomiting has a risk for aspiration, and then auscultating the lung sounds, um, you know, check for any adventitious lung sounds and treat as necessary. Moving on to circulation, remember that's perfusion. And you're going to want to assess the skin color, the temperature, and the moisture. Uh, your pale, cool, diaphoretic patient is somebody that is hypoperfused. They're in some kind of shock. If they're hot to the touch, maybe flushed or something like that, they could have an infection or could be septic. Keep that in mind. And remember, not all septic patients are hot. Some septic patients are very cold and they're hypothermic. And that's going to be your worse off septic patients, actually. When they become decompensated, their temperatures start to you know plummet. Um, so keep in mind that you don't have to have a temperature to be septic. Um, you're going to also want to determine the pulse rate, the rhythm, and the quality. And compare your peripheral pulses with your central pulses to see if you know, they're having a decrease in perfusion. Next, pre-hospitally, we like to make a transport decision at this point. We've uh, finished our primary survey, our primary assessment, and now it's time to decide uh, if it's a load and go situation and where we want to go. So you're going to want to uh, integrate the information from your primary survey all together and if positive orthostatic uh, vital signs, carefully consider how to move the patient. Because remember, if, if they're orthostatic, then when you sit them up, they can become, you know, near syncopal. If you try to stand them and walk to them in stretcher, you know, you're going to become syncopal. So how are you going to move this patient? Be careful when transporting a patient in severe pain uh, because, again, syncope is possible. So think about pre-medicating before moving any patient that's in severe pain. Um, and if they're actively vomiting, consider giving them an antiemetic to, to kind of make your job a little bit easier um, and also cleaner in the back of the ambulance. Uh, choose the mode of ambulance. So transportation of the patient with GI disease rarely requires lights and sirens. Um, but again, there are that, you know, uh, subsect of patients that are, you know, critically ill. So if they have an airway or breathing compromise, if they're severely septic, these patients may require an emergent transport. So most GI patients not going to require emergent transport, but you keep in mind that you know if there's any airway breathing or circulation compromise, that they will require an emergent transport. Remember, an important component of your assessment is gathering your history of the present illness, and a sample history is a good component of that. So your sample history helps you gather information. Uh, many patients with GI disorders have a history of long-standing medical issues. Uh, disorders can quickly increase in the intensity and ask the patient if uh, the issue has occurred before. You know, have you had anything like this happen before? Often they, they don't just offer that information up. You have to ask about it and then ask them, what did they do for you at the hospital? What did they tell you was wrong? What medications did they send you home with? You know, all of these things are going to be very helpful. A common frame of reference is important. Uh, one person's diarrhea is another person's soft stool. So you know, actually use some sort of uh, descriptive explanation when you're trying to ask about these things. And ask about the changes in bowel patterns or the color or type of stool, recent onset of diarrhea, constipation or nausea and vomiting, you know, has any of that occurred? Have they had any recent weight loss? Uh, what was their last meal? And uh, how, you know, how did they tolerate that last meal when they tried to eat it? Were they able to take all of it down? Just a little bit, did it taste foul, anything like that. Then we'll move on to our secondary assessment. And depending on how emergent this patient is, this will happen on scene or during transport, uh, if you're talking pre-hospitally. Uh, there should be no major changes within the examination of the head, neck, or chest that directly relate to a GI concern. The major effects from GI disease on the nervous, cardiovascular, or the respiratory system result from pain or hypovolemia or maybe even an infection. Uh, throat pain is possible if a patient has an esophageal pathology or if they've been vomiting a lot. A lot of times when people vomit a lot, they might have some chest pain or throat pain. Uh, examining the abdomen should, uh, should involve greater detail because this is a GI concern. So make sure you palpate the abdomen, you assess for tenderness, rebound tenderness, you know, uh, is it distended and hard? That indicates some sort of maybe bleeding or, or guarding. Uh, check the skin for irregularities. Are there scars indicating trauma or any past surgery? Do they have stretch marks like in this image here? Okay, so all of these things are going to help you uh, with your secondary assessment. 
assess that abdomen for you know asymmetry because it, it could be caused by something like a tumor, a hernia, like you see here, a really bad hernia, um, enlarged or distended organs, or even uh, you know pregnancy. They could be pretty gravid, and you could actually palpate uh, the uh, the enlarged uterus. So assess for any asymmetric findings because the abdomen should be pretty symmetrical. You're also going to want to note the shape of the abdomen. Is it flat, round, protuberant, or uh, scaphoid, or like concave is what that means. Um, any of these findings uh, don't necessarily lean towards a certain pathology, but coupled with other assessment findings, you could, for instance, a distended abdomen with a history of liver failure could clue you into ascites. But a distended abdomen in you know, a young childbearing female could be you know, pregnancy. So uh, keep in mind that these don't necessarily have specific pathologies tied to them, but coupled with you know, the, the full gamut of information that you're going to gather, you could use this abdominal shape to help figure out what's going on. The assessment of bowel sounds is also a part of your secondary assessment. Now in your emergent uh, critical patient, this is probably going to not occur because bowel sounds take a few minutes to properly assess. So this generally happens in the hospital setting, you know, so maybe in the emergency room or if they make it to the floor. Uh, but some of the sounds you might hear are, you know, gurgles or clicks or a borborygmy, uh, increased activity or decreased activity or maybe no activity. And again, you have to be listening to, for a few minutes to say that there's absent bowel sounds, you know. Uh, so it's not something that you'll be able to, uh, to diagnose and assess in a relatively short period of time. Abdominal percussion is also a secondary assessment that's often overlooked in the pre-hospital arena. And even often in the, uh, in the emergency department, you don't see it done, except for by your most skilled physicians that still do very good hands-on assessment. Uh, so the abdomen should be empty, and, and the upper left and upper right quadrant will sound duller than the rest of the abdomen. Um, and percussion involves, you know, putting your fingers, you know, on the different organs or areas of the, of the abdomen, and you're going to tap on your fingernail and listen for that dullness or the hyperresonance or, you know, the different sounds that hollow organs versus solid organs should make. Abdominal palpation is uh, often done pre-hospitally, but you know some people are better at it than others. Remember, you don't have to push down super hard with two hands or anything like that, especially in somebody that's got previous abdominal pain. So if they're presenting with abdominal pain, f figure out which quadrant the abdominal pain is, is in and then go to the furthest quadrant away from that and start your palpation. Because often if you elicit more pain when you palpate the area that's already in pain, it's going to be very difficult to assess the rest of the abdomen. All right, so on light palpation, the abdomen should be smooth. Note the presence of any masses, which may indicate an enlarged liver or a bowel distension or aortic aneurysm or maybe even a cancerous tumor. So use your, you know, your tactile senses to smoothly and softly palpate those four quadrants and, and feel for those different uh, abnormalities. So abdominal pain can indicate different things, such as trauma, hemorrhage, infection, obstruction, or any serious condition, right? And then the types of pain are a little bit different. You have visceral pain versus parietal or somatic pain, and then referred pain. Uh, so all of these different things uh, tell us about different conditions. So let's look at these different pains. So visceral pain uh, is usually originated by a hollow organ. All right, visceral pain originates from hollow organ, you know, inflammation or rupture or, you know, something going on with a hollow organ. It's difficult to localize, and it's described generally as a burning, a cramping, gnawing, or aching. It's usually felt superficially, and it can be caused by organ, where the organ contracts too forcefully or is distended or stretched, okay? Parietal pain or rebound pain uh, is generally from the peritoneum, okay, and remember you have a parietal peritoneum that surrounds the entire abdominal cavity. It's steady, achy pain, easier to localize than visceral pain, and it, the pain increases with movement. So as they move, even as they lean forward versus backwards, they may have an increase or a decrease in that pain, and the inflammation of the peritoneum is what causes this pain, 
so the peritonitis, so to speak, of the abdomen. And then somatic pain is uh, due to the peripheral nerve tracts, and it's localized pain usually felt deeply, deep in the body. Uh, irritation of an injury, uh, or, or irritation of or injury to tissue, excuse me, uh, causing activation of peripheral nerve tracts, okay, somatic pain. And then referred pain is, the again, the peripheral nerve tracts, pain originating in the abdomen and causing the perception of pain in distant locations. So you, you might be familiar with chest pain where the, somebody also has referred pain to their jaw or to their left arm. In this case, they could have, you know, abdominal pain with referred pain to their shoulder or something like that. Um, it, it's attributable to similar paths for the peripheral nerves of the abdomen and those in the distant location. So, for example, the pancreas uh, may also have the same nerve tract that the, you know, left shoulder has. So you could have pain in both of those areas due to pancreatitis. Or the appendix has a nerve that is also tied to the muscles that go down the right leg. Uh, so you could have, uh, you know, severe right uh, lower quadrant pain, and it could even become worse with leg movement, or you might feel it down into the leg, um, and that's what referred pain is. So I mentioned rebound tenderness when talking about parietal pain, uh, and it occurs when the peritoneum is irritated, and it could actually suggest a life-threatening problem. And what rebound tenderness is, is when you palpate the patient's abdomen, as you release the palpation, they start to feel that pain. That's obviously related to a peritoneal irritation, okay? And that peritoneum is, again, is that lining around the abdominal cavity. So the peritoneum pain is rebound tenderness, which is upon the release of palpation. All right, let's talk about vital signs uh, for your abdominal and GI emergency patient. Uh, obtain your orthostatic vital signs uh, because those are going to be uh, important to, to gauge the extent of any bleeding. Uh, you know, so a 20 millimeter mercury drop in systolic blood pressure or a 10 millimeter, millimeter mercury uh, increase in diastolic pressure, which would be a narrowing pulse pressure, or a 20 beat increase in the pulse rate can all indicate a, a positive orthostatic finding, which indicates significant blood loss. Usually people are uh, orthostatic due to hypovolemia. It could be dehydration, or it could be hemorrhagic hypovolemia. So keep that both, them, both of those in mind. They could have a GI bleed, and that's why they're hypovolemic, or they could have been having nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea for the past six days, and that's why they're hypovolemic. So always consider rehydrating these patients. In fact, don't consider it. Do it. Give these patients fluid. They're all going to need it. Uh, ultrasonography testing may also be available, and it is available pre-hospital. They do ultrasounds. Uh, pretty regularly, especially in some flight services. Uh, research does not support its use in the pre-hospital setting, but it is done in many different areas, and there's st it's still so new that they're gathering research. Eventually, maybe it'll have some benefit shown. Uh, it's just about the right people doing the right studies. And whenever you assess, you're going to want to make sure you reassess. So one set of vital signs is useless. Continue reassessment and routine monitoring of the pulse rate, the EKG, your blood pressure, your respiratory rate, your pulse ox, even your capnogram. Continue to get the, those things um, and, and, and look for any trends or changes. Again, the or orthostatic vital signs are huge um, in, in determining you know, whether they're having some hypovolemia and uh, some perfusion issues, but also you know, any, anybody that's septic is going to present pretty tachycardic. And as you give them fluids, you can bring that heart rate down a little bit, bring that blood pressure up. So all these things are going to be important to constantly monitor. And within that routine monitoring, uh, you're going to assess for signs of shock. Uh, if your patient has a GI bleed, they're going to potentially be in hypovolemic shock. Um, so again, fluids is going to be very important for that patient. And then determine the effects of your treatment on the patient. The only way to do that is to continuously get trends of vital signs before and after treatment. And that brings us to the end of this video on abdominal and GI emergencies.